time tonight. Okay, well, in particular, welcome. Um, so I'm, that means I need to introduce myself. So I'm, I'm Carol Willis. I'm the founder and director and curator of the Skyscraper Museum. And I hope you had a little time before you planted yourself in a, in a chair to look around the exhibition. But uh, after the, the talk, you, I invite you to look around our Shanghai show and to come back uh, another time as well in order to absorb, I hope, some of the mission of the museum, which is to explore both uh, New York topics and national and international topics of the skyscraper and urbanism. Uh, and I hope to become members of the Skyscraper Museum. And if you're not, all right, I'm not sure how, I know we're on some blogs and all, and, and how you found out about this evening, but uh, be sure to leave your, your email address and we'll keep you on our, um, our email blast so you'll hear about all of our programs. Uh, so tonight is the uh, first, actually, of our winter series, winter and spring series, uh, and the card, if you're not on our mailing list, is, is right here and around the corner, you can pick one up. And um, we're really delighted uh, to have David Holmes speaking tonight because he is uh, somebody, uh, I, think, I think he's aware, but maybe not to the, the extent that, I, that I'll fawn over you uh, this, this evening, um, how much of uh, an influence uh, the he has been on uh, on our, our thinking. Our I suppose sort of vibrates in uh, in sympathy with a lot of the work that the, the skyscraper museum has been devoted to. And I was able uh, to pull off my shelf the very article that started that initiated uh, the book that we're, we're going to be um, hearing about tonight. Uh, from the New Yorker article of October 18, 2004, which is still on my shelf, which shows how little I, I tend to clean anything up um, um, in my office. Uh, but as long as it's here, I don't I think that uh, there's probably not that many people who can just put their finger on this particular article anymore. But here it is. Um, a, a fantastic article, Green Manhattan, um, Everywhere Should Be More Like New York. Uh, and this had come out uh, in a little in advance of, but uh, um, very much uh, at the same time that the museum was exploring the idea for an exhibition that, that in 2006 uh, opened called Green Towers for New York and a lecture series that we did called Green, uh, green Teams, how, um, how Green Succeeds in Business. Right? Um, so I, I think 2004 was a very early moment in the, in the Green Revolution. Uh, lead rating, how many of you are architects who are here? Yeah. Well, only a few. Uh, it's a common that we have uh, um, a battalion of architects or engineers, any engineers? A couple engineers, uh, okay. Um, lead rated or not? Yep, see, there you go, okay. So there's a, gonna be a whole sliding range of expertise, I guess, in the audience. Uh, but in 2004 was a very early moment when, when green was not necessarily understood with the same kind of common parlance about energy efficiency and environmental consciousness um, that, that um, it um, adorns the full page advertisements in the New York Times and other places that we see people, large corporations um, touting their uh, responsibility to, to the environment and their efficiency. Um, it was, uh, it was a, a moment for the museum to explore an idea that, um, that, that astonished me when I began to think about it and I thought really needed to be publicized. And that was the, the um, more than a notion, the, the truth, um, that New York was a leader in green building and commercial, commercial architecture and commercial real estate. So back when we started putting the show together, um, I talked to the same kind of people that David was talking to, I'm sure, the architects like Bruce Fell and Bob Fox and Rick Cook, um, architects who became the leaders of uh, the, the green building movement, um, especially in commercial architecture. And they were doing these fantastic projects that were just on the boards at the time, like the Bank of America Tower um, uh, at, at uh, one Times Square. And uh, Fort, Fort Times Square, of course, had already been built and was the first, uh, first green skyscraper. Uh, but there were also other projects around town, and when we when we asked all the architects and engineers we knew, we could we identified 14 projects um, in New York that were high-rise buildings that qualified as what we as we saw as green towers, and many of them were here right in Battery Park City, where the first 
uh, green guidelines were, mandatory green guidelines were instituted as of 2001. So here we were planted in a, in a special environment in Battery Park City where the mission to demonstrate uh, a new way of building was being undertaken by the, uh, the leadership and the, the authority. Uh, where there were a cutting edge of architects and engineers who were dedicated environmentalists, but also um, evangelists for a new kind of building. And it was just on the cusp uh, of, of this idea that, um, that David's article, or uh, maybe before the cusp, but David's article um, came out in the New Yorker. And you read through this thing, as I remember clearly reading it and saying, yes, yes, you know, that's right, that's exactly right which is the same kind of feeling that I remember having when back, you know, lo these many years ago, I read Death and Life of Great American City. So somebody gave me my first copy of Jane Jacobs, and you read the thing, you said, there was a clarity of writing, there was a kind of simple delivery of logic, but clear and eloquent in, in examples, um, that, that echoes, I think, that's, that same kind of uh, I suppose, uh, non-academic writing that, uh, uh, that, that we like to read um, in the New Yorker and other places, but certainly characterizes um, the New Yorker um, um, as, a, as a perfect description, I think, of, of uh, the stable of writers who, who do uh, work there. And David is a staff writer in the New Yorker. Here, I'm going to introduce him now. Um, uh, what I learned uh, on Wikipedia is that you were born on Valentine's Day, the 14th, right? So, we're both Aquarians, I think that makes us. Uh, he has been a staff writer at the New Yorker since 1991, so that's like 18 years, amazing. Uh, and also, as a, um, here's a, something I know absolutely nothing about, he's a contributing editor at Golf Digest. So I would, are there any golfers in the audience? No. See, so this is the great divide. This is the, the, art, the architecture uh, group. Uh, he has uh, written for a number of other major publications um, before, like Harper's and Atlantic. Uh, and I think when you look down that long, the long list of, of articles, you see that uh, that eclecticism probably uh, describes your interest as, as well as anything. Uh, but especially the kind of eclecticism that one constantly reads um, in the New Yorker, where you find a, a theme and then uh, and it's it's the, the thread takes you off on side. Uh, side journeys with incredible uh, detail and uh, and uh, and with a logic that con that often contradicts uh, uh, conventional wisdom. So uh, it's all of those things that I've particularly appreciated uh, um, reading uh, in David's writing over the years, and so I'm really thrilled that he's here in order to tell us about the person today. Thanks, Carol. I can go even farther back in time uh, to my, be, even beyond my birthday, to when my wife and I were married uh, 31 years ago. It seems amazing to me. <laughs> we were uh, very young and naive, and for seven years we lived uh, in a utopian environmentalist community in New York State. We lived in a very small space, just 700 square feet. Uh, we didn't have a car or a lawn. Uh, we did our grocery shopping on foot, and when we had to travel longer distances, we traveled by public transportation. We, uh, our electric bill worked out to just a dollar a day. We uh, had no large appliances. Uh, the utopian community was Manhattan. Uh, we lived at 69th and 2nd in an apartment on the 14th floor of a red brick high rise. The, uh, I think most Americans, even most New Yorkers, are used to thinking of the city as a, an environmental disaster area. It's all concrete and diesel fumes and noise and traffic jams. But by the most significant measures, New York City, I believe, is the greenest community in the United States and one of the greenest in the world. Uh, New Yorkers uh, consume gasoline at the lowest rate in the United States, the, uh, about uh, 90, I think it's 90 gallons a year versus uh, something like a national average of 500 or 450. Uh, Vermont, which was voted the number one greenest state in the country by Forbes, uh, has an average, a per capita average of 550 gallons. Uh, 
New York State, entirely because of New York City, has the lowest per capita electricity use in the country. Uh, New Yorkers are the are the are the lowest uh, per capita electricity users. If the uh, New York City is larger in population than all but 11 states, if you made it a state, it would rank 51st in per capita energy use in all categories. Um, New Yorkers are. Uh, have the, are low per capita uh, users of water. They're low per capita generators of uh, solid waste. They are. They have the smallest carbon footprint in the country, about seven and a half metric tons uh, per person, versus the national average of almost 25. Uh, New York City's uh, per capita carbon footprint isn't quite what Sweden's is, but Manhattan's. Manhattan's is. Uh, the for the country as a whole to achieve. Uh, the, man, the New York City carbon footprint re would require a national reduction of 70%, which is considerably more than anything anybody's talking about doing. Uh, New York City residents are also the largest consumers of public transportation in the country by far. Uh, almost half of all the, almost a third of all the public transit passenger miles traveled in the United States are traveled in the metropolitan New York City region. Uh, New York has uh, half of all the subway stops in the United States. The subway line, I can't remember exactly what this, uh, uh, exactly which the line is, but it's a single bus route in, in New York City, uh, accounts for more transit passenger miles than the second largest uh, transit system in the United States, the second largest uh, bus transit system in the United States. Uh, the key to all these environmental wonders is uh, population density. New York City is by far the densest uh, uh, place in the United States. Manhattan's density is uh, about almost 70,000 people per square mile, which is uh, uh, far beyond uh, the rest of the country. It's 30 times Los Angeles, five times Chicago. Um, the density is critical because it, uh, it makes possible everything. It's uh, density of people and of destinations. Uh, when you put people close together, you make public transit work. Uh, when you put people close together, you make it possible for them to uh, get from one place to another on foot or by, or by bus or by subway. Uh, you make efficient transit possible. Uh, and you uh, do achieve the, probably the key element, which is to uh, break the chain of dependence, uh, the American dependence on the automobile. New Yorkers are the, uh, by far, the, the uh, least intoxicated automobile owners in the United States. The, uh, more than half of New York City households don't own a car. In the rest of the country, it's, uh, it's, it's basically zero. 77% of Manhattan resident of households don't own a car. And New Yorkers don't use cars the way other people do. Manhattanites tend to use them on weekends to get out of the city, and they don't drive terribly far in them. Uh, people in the outer boroughs uh, tend to use them to uh, infrequently and to shop. And multiple car ownership uh, is in a, in a family is, is a rarity. The, uh, in the rest of the country, in 2001, we crossed a sort of sinister threshold. Uh, that was a year that the number of registered vehicles in the United States uh, for the first time exceeded the number of licensed drivers. So we have more cars than we have, we have, we have more cars than we have uh, drivers. That was, uh, came close to being true in my family, uh, but, but uh, not quite. Um, all these, uh, these, I think, environmentally significant facts I began to think about them uh, 25 years ago when my wife and I moved away from New York City. We, uh, we had a daughter when we were uh, living in the city in 1984, and, it, and by 1985 she had morphed into this uh, very active person, and we decided that we didn't want to bring her up in a city. And we moved about 100 miles north to a small town in Connecticut, a town of about 4,000 people. The, uh, we live in a 200-year-old house. We live in a recycled house. We live across a dirt road from a 4,000-acre uh, nature preserve. Uh, I've seen a bear in my yard. There are uh, 
uh, deer and raccoons and uh, everything else. Right? There's a stream down at the bottom of the hill and I can hear it rushing by. Uh, there's a 19th century railroad tunnel that I can walk to from my door without uh, crossing it, without, while crossing only one paved road. Uh, and it seemed like when we when we moved to Connecticut that we had stepped into Arcadia, mm -hmm. uh, but in fact our our move was a uh, an environmental uh, disaster. We went from owning no cars to owning uh, one car, our first car, and then immediately realized that one car wasn't enough uh, because if you have one car, you can't pick up your car uh, from the mechanic and take it on to have a service. And uh, then, uh, so we got a second car, and then uh, we acquired a third car as a result of a mild midlife crisis of mine. And then when, uh, when our two kids became old enough to drive, that car became a necessity. The people who live in the city and imagine rural life uh, picture uh, doing things like going for walks and uh, uh, kayaking down rivers and hiking through the woods and gathering eggs from your own chickens. But what you really do when you move out of the city is move into a car and move your, your children into car seats. We went from driving uh, close to zero miles a year to driving initially about 30 miles, 30,000 miles a year between us. Uh, my, our, my kids are grown now, so my wife and I still drive uh, 20,000 miles uh, a year, which is just about the national average for, for a family. We, almost everything we do outside of our house involves a car trip, because when you live in a, a small, low density area, there's virtually no place that's accessible by bicycle or on foot, and there's no public transit, because there's uh, no conceivable way to organize an efficient public transit system when people live so far from, from each other. We, my, when we lived in New York City, uh, our pediatrician, uh, the office of our pediatrician was in the office of our apartment building, uh, which a uh, fact that uh, did not encourage self-reliant parenting, but that uh, was extraordinarily convenient because elevators are among the most fuel-efficient passenger vehicles in the world. Now where we live in Connecticut, my dentist is uh, uh, two towns away. It's a round, round trip by car of 32 miles. The nearest uh, movie theater to where we live is a 20-minute drive away, so is the nearest large grocery store. Uh, when we used to get DVDs from Blockbuster, it was a two-gallon per movie uh, investment because the nearest Blockbuster was 10 miles away and every rental involved two round trips. The, the, the difference was uh, striking and as I, as I thought about as I thought about this and the, a useful uh, way to judge any human activity is to multiply it by 300 million if you're an American uh, or by if you're thinking globally by uh, 7 billion going up to 9 billion and the, clearly the life that uh, this pleasant seeming surrounded by green life that we were living in our small town in Connecticut doesn't scale uh, whereas dense urban life uh, does and as we think about the, uh, the various gathering environmental crises that the world faces it seems clear to me that one of the, the few certain tools that we have at our disposal is urban density and the, uh, the compacting of, of, of human beings, in effect, uh, of making them more efficient by, by moving them closer together. It's a, a, a concept that not everybody finds easy to, to think about. There are several reactions that I've, I've had from people as I talk about this, as I've got around talking about it. One, the one reaction is, is a sort of no way, and then, uh, oh yeah, duh. It's like the, immediately from, that's impossible to, oh yeah, it's obvious. That's one reaction. Another that I, uh, from, uh, that I experienced in Portland, Oregon is a kind of, you know, put up your dupes, New York versus Portland. Uh, uh, and I was saying, no, it's really not about, it's really not about which city is greener. It's more like, let's see if we can understand what it is that makes, that actually makes, uh, people that actually reduces carbon footprint. 
And it's not the way they think about it in Portland, and they, they want to fight. I talked to a group of graduate students at Yale uh, in the forestry uh, department who were completely appalled by the idea that it was even possible to talk about green. There wasn't a discussion of, of a deep personal commitment to veganism and a particular <laughs> lifestyle. It, it was results were, it's like the difference between works and, uh, and faith, or works and grace, that there were, it didn't matter what you do, it's, it's, or it doesn't matter what, what the result is, it's all what you do. I can't remember, I can't figure out which one would be which. But for them, it was intention was everything and results meant nothing. Uh, I talked to someone in uh, New York City at a talk in New York City who said, well, I explained this idea to him, and he, he said, he said, but it's just because everybody's all crammed together. And I said, yeah, that's it, that's it, exactly. <laughs> and he said, but it's all, it's all unconscious. And I said that it's the, the best, uh, the best, uh, the best environmental uh, results are the unconscious ones because you don't have to enforce them. You don't have to uh, ch alter human nature in order to bring them about. The efficiency of New Yorkers, the small carbon footprint, is simply a result of the way New Yorkers live. It's not a, because New Yorkers have, uh, have undergone a uh, green karmic transformation and now go around turning off lights and, uh, uh, and unplugging things. It's just a natural consequence of what happens when people live in spaces that are too small and live close enough to their neighbors and to their daily destinations uh, that, that, that they don't need a car. Uh, there are also some, I think, some sort of uh, paradoxical uh, green characteristics of New York. There are some, some things about New York that make it uh, green, that make it efficient, and that, make, that keep the carbon footprint small. It seemed like opposite talk when you uh, bring them up to people. Uh, one of them is the what people, I think, uh, most often think of as a, a terrible environmental problem, which is the, the, the congestion on the streets of New York, traffic congestion. And it looks like an environmental problem, uh, but in fact, congestion, uh, congestion on the streets of New York is one of the things that makes a subway work. If, the, if using a car in New York City were uh, humanly rational, more people would do it and would be less inclined to use the subway. I think everybody who's visited New York has had the experience of sitting in a taxi cab and watching a little old lady on the sidewalk uh, <laughs> overtake you and disappear over the horizon. And, uh, the, as you st and that fact, that experience, is what makes the subway work. The, I think the thing that we've seen over and over again is that a city can have the most magnificent uh, uh, transit system that federal funds can build, and yet, uh, it remains unused or high, heavily underused if there is any possibility whatsoever that people can get to where they're going by car. Uh, New York City is one of the only places in the United States where you'll hear someone say, uh, we better take the subway, we don't have time to take a cab. It's not really true any place else in the country. And it goes a long way toward explaining the extraordinary uh, drop-off, the, the Tiger Woods-like drop-off from the success of New York City's public transit system to everybody else. Uh, Washington, D.C. is, a, is a, a good counterexample. It's often uh, given by mentioned by people as the most beautiful American city, the most European American city. It was laid out at almost exactly the same time New York City was, right about the turn of the, the, uh, of the, 19, of the 19th century, the early 1800s. Um, it, uh, and, it's, and it's beautiful, but environmentally, it's, it's, a dread, it's terrible. Uh, it was not designed for the automobile, but it was easily adapted to it. The sort of the broad, uh, at the broad streets that uh, made it very easy, to, were easily adapted to cars. The, the statutory limit on building height uh, keeps the density relatively low. When you, when you make a city low, you make it wide. It's like pouring water across the floor. The uh, traffic circles are difficult to negotiate uh, on foot. I was in, uh, uh, in, in the, large, the, the large public spaces, these, these tremendous parks and, and great uh, malls, and, and, or, which look tremendous on Google Earth, for example, <laughs> uh, and are, are wonderful places to walk around in. 
but they make the city very hard to get around on foot. They're what uh, you mentioned Jane Jacobs earlier in the Death and Life of Great American Cities when she talked about border vacuums, which is impediments to pedestrian traffic, the things that halt the flow of, 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 of human activity in a city. And there are many of the large public spaces in, in, uh, in Washington, D.C. have that same function, as do things like DuPont Circle and the, and the wide streets. You're thwarted every time you, you try to go someplace. Uh, Washington, D.C., most of it also doesn't have the, the, sort of the tremendously fertile mix of uses that you find in, in the liveliest parts of Manhattan, where you have the, uh, within a block, you have, I, I once wrote a, a, a little humor piece in The New Yorker, uh, this was in the early days of the internet, and I claimed that, the, that, that New York City that the, the internet was actually plagiarized, the World Wide Web was plagiarized from New York City, and that, that the hyperlink was a, was a Manhattan invention, and that the evidence of it was that every, on every, in every block in New York, there was a door through which you could enter the same Chinese restaurant. <laughs> <laughs> and what you have in New York is, in, in, the, in the places that function the best, are you, you walk out of your building and there's a grocery store across the street, probably two grocery stores, there's a shoe repair store, and try even finding a shoe repair store in the rest of the United States. Uh, there's maybe a, a liquor store in your own, in your very own building, uh, a doctor's office, a series of doctor's offices. Uh, uh, all these uh, destinations, right in a residential neighborhood, which is complete, completely uh, uh, contrary to the to the guiding principle by which we built most of the rest of the country. There are. Uh, the parts of New York that function the best are the places where the mixes are, the uses are the most mixed up. Um, I'm the chairman of the zoning commission in the little town where I live, and we devote all our effort to keeping uses widely, widely <laughs> separated. Uh, we, we're, our regulations are a blueprint for sprawl, and you know, that's had the, the effect that they've had, not only in our little town, but all, all across the country. Um, I think that uh, it's useful but difficult to talk about environmentalism in these terms, to talk about the environment in these terms, and to talk about environmental strategies in these terms. The, the, the case that I try to make in the book is that the, the, uh, uh, what we need to do, the challenge we face, is to, uh, to as this country grows, to encourage uh, the, that growth to take place in the, where we usefully increase uh, density in places that where it is most useful to increase it, and that we pro uh, that we uh, provide disincentives to uh, uh, to the kind of way that we have developed the country, which is basically just spreading out. I grew up in Kansas City, uh, which uh, the Sierra Club uh, selected as I think as, I don't know it was maybe the number one, but it was one of the top top five certainly most sprawl threatened cities in the United States. The, uh, it has, uh, according to the, I think this is a, from the Sierra Club, it has more uh, highway miles per capita than any other uh, municipality in the United States. I know that when, when I was a kid, which was a long time ago, not that long ago, uh, the places where uh, we used to drive out to, to uh, do bad things uh, because we were so far away that no one would see us. Now we're so far, are so far in town that they're practically downtown. Uh, places where we used to go park and uh, smoke bad things were are now the, the uh, cookie cutter residential subdivisions that have become practically uh, little mini communities of their own. They're they, this just sprawling mass uh, that has spread across uh, across the Midwest. The, one of the great differences between a city like Kansas City and New York City is that in, in Kansas City there are no natural, uh, there's no Hudson River and East River, uh, there are no natural barriers to horizontal growth. There's really nothing uh, between to stop Kansas City between Lake Michigan and uh, the Gulf of Mexico. <laughs> Wide open country. Uh, for both of them, and that's the, and that's the way they've been growing. Um, I think instead we tend to uh, 
in terms of policy and in, in terms of uh, the, the way we think about the environment, we tend to uh, engage, engage in and pursue uh, dead-end strategies or strategies that actually leave us worse off than we were before. Uh, Americans are, are very good at solutions that involve involve buying things. We're always happy to uh, buy a new car or uh, you know, redo the kitchen with bamboo uh, cabinets or uh, uh, eat better tasting tomatoes. There are these are the kinds of environmental solutions that we, that we like. And we're not good at uh, any solution that involves less. The uh, I think that, that explains, for example, the tremendous popularity of the, of the Prius, the, the Toyota Prius. Um, there are, uh, there's a, a series of uh, Prius commercials, which I'm especially fond of, and if I had a PowerPoint presentation, <laughs> I, would, I would be showing you a, uh, so you can imagine this, but there's a, a, a Prius commercial in which a, a, a Prius is driving through a, a colorless landscape, and as it passes, the colorless landscape bursts into bursts into color and becomes green, and it it it, it reflects and encourages this idea that I think is very widespread, which is that as you drive your hybrid car, you you are actively performing a service to humanity and the environment. You're like vacuuming things out of the, the you're leaving it better than it was before you before you before you passed by. Uh, there are a number of uh, consumer goods that we think of as, as green that behave in that way. But the argument I make in the book is that, that, that miles per gallon are, are almost beside the point. That although a, uh, a, it's a car, mile for mile, an efficient car is better than an inefficient car, nevertheless, when we increase the efficiency of our machines, we're also reducing the cost of operating them, and we tend to use them more. And increasing the efficiency of our devices is of no use to the environment if that's if that's all we do. If we aren't also, we have to, you have to keep your foot on the other side as well. And uh, the, in the I think the strongest evidence for that we saw in 2008 when the price of when the price of oil got very high uh, and the, the world's economies imploded. And what we saw then was was something that I think even the most optimistic environmentalists uh, in the world hadn't been anticipating. Uh, hadn't been expecting by any means, which was an actual significant measurable drop in the world's carbon footprint. Uh, it actually shrank by something like two and a half percent. And it, that was the result not of uh, any uh, investment by governments into uh, green technologies or green programs. It was simply a result of the fact that energy got expensive and people had less money and they used less of it. Uh, people who have lost their jobs or are worried about their jobs uh, turn down their thermostats, they stop feeding their swimming pool, they drive fewer miles, factories that are shuttered spew less carbon into the atmosphere. All these things happen. And I think we see also that when, when, the, when things turn in the other direction, the, the opposite happens. And we're seeing it, I've noticed it right now today on the front page of the New York Times, there's an article about the recovery of General Motors and how they have suddenly $50 billion in cash that they they're know what to do with, they're, uh, that they now have to invest in the future. And one of the major things that they're investing it in is in new models of SUVs and pickup trucks. Uh, so even, it's not just that people don't remember the 70s, people don't remember earlier this year. Uh, and I think in, in some ways that's one of the best things about the human race, this amazing ability we have to pick ourselves up and go on after after setbacks, but it's also sort of a discouraging uh, uh, fact about human beings, the fact that we are able to uh, uh, just pretty much compartmentalize uh, what we know and put it aside and go on as before. Um, I think I'm probably at the point where I'm just going to talk in circles and I might uh, uh, take some questions if there are any, and if they're, if they're not, then I can, uh, I can just I can go on on my own. Yes. Um, yeah, I'm sympathetic to your point of view, but I have three qualms or yes. uh, um, things that I think should be taken into account. One is that if you look at New York City holistically, it's not just Manhattan and skyscrapers. It's the center of a large megalopolis that includes Long Island and large swaths of New Jersey. And in a way, the two have to be looked at as a whole. 
and they sort of uh, make each other possible. Um, and I grew up on in Queens, which was farmland, and then right. it, it paved over up to Montauk so, you know, since then. Um, the other thing is that there's another epiphenomenon of urban life, which is that if you take neighborhoods like the South Bronx or Harlem, the asthma rates are the highest in the country. And that relates to my third point, which is that just one factor in all the vacations that people in New York can afford to take all over the place and all the flying miles. So there's something about the density which also creates a lack of biophilic possibilities, to yep. in Wilson's term. So I think one has to look at it more holistically, even though by and large, there are you know, factors that have to be looked at. I agree. I'll, I'll talk about both of them. Uh, the, the first, if I, I've already exa forgotten exactly what you said. But yes, I think that those figures do take into account that the, the, that idea takes into account the interrelatedness of all these places. It, it's very hard with any place to, uh, to separate those out. I mean, these, the networks of consumption and energy use that we have are tremendous and un, un disentangleable. Uh, nevertheless, I think these, the, the key, the core facts are that to, if you want to make public transit work, you have to move people and their destinations close together. If you, uh, there, there was somebody I talked to in, in Portland, uh, or, or who came to a talking game in Portland, who had uh, offered what I think is a, a good measure of what makes a walkable city, for example. New York City is one of the, the last places in the United States where walking is a primary form of transportation. It may be the last place in the United States where walking is a, a primary, many people's primary form of transportation. He said what you need is, is a walkable grocery store. And, and, and I think that's true. So there's a, there's a kind of, I think there's a, a threshold density that makes transit work, that makes walking work, that makes efficiencies work, and it's, it's pretty dense, and it involves tall buildings, which is a good reason to be talking about this here. here, here, here. On the second point, you're exactly right, and, and it's even worse than you, than you say, because density, <coughs> in addition to making people uh, efficient, makes disasters efficient too. It makes asthma efficient, if, if indeed that's one of the causes of it. But there are many other things. That, you know, uh, uh, diseases of all kinds, the crowds, are, are not good for them. Uh, if we ever suffer a, a, a bio, uh, bio weapons attack, places like New York City will be much more vulnerable than others. The plague, all the, the sort of the great disasters of human history have always hit hardest in cities. Uh, density has a tremendous downside. And, and, I know it very well, and I moved away from it in order to get away from it. Uh, and, and for those reasons, I think that, the, that when we talk about environmental solutions, we, we can't talk, it's not a single list. There are different uh, lists in different places. In dense cities, if there is environmental value to putting people close together, then I think that the, the critical environmental issues in a place like New York uh, are not things like solar panels on buildings, or uh, lead uh, designated buildings or, or any of those things. I think it's things like education, it's crime, it's the health issues we talk about. Uh, I think that also there are, there are well, a number of issues that we think of as, uh, that we think of as standard environmental issues like air quality. Uh, globally, or per, globally, New York City is a great, uh, 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 a great global citizen in terms of of what it puts into the air. It, it, we contribute less per person than many other parts of the country. Locally, the air is a problem. If you, if you live in New York City, I know when we, we lived here, we were constantly washing things that we no longer have to wash uh, where we live now. And, uh, I found out that uh, the rug we had in our living room was a completely different color from what I had come to think that it was when we lived in New York City. Noise is a, a, an issue in New York City, and it's, it's a potential deal breaker for somebody uh, living in the city. So I think there are all those things, and I think probably education is a, is a super crit critical one. It's what sends people fleeing uh, away from, uh, from, from places that are served by public transit and out to places, these inefficient places. So yeah, I, 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 I agree with, with, uh, with all those things. My self-education did the opposite. I was I flee a sprawling area and I moved to an urban area and I haven't looked at. That's good. Well, my daughter now is, lives in New York City in an apartment that is about the size of her childhood bedroom. <laughs> I think there's a one thing that I think where the the mainstream traditional American uh, uh, sort of 
environmental movement has let us down is by perpetuating or creating and perpetuating the idea that there's something to pray, that urban life is to pray, and that it, there's, it, it's inauthentic. And it goes back to, to Henry David Thoreau and John Muir and the idea that you, you aren't alive until you're out of the city. Uh, I think it would make more sense for the future of the globe for us to think, look at the, our environmental problems from the opposite direction, to think instead of doing what we normally do, which is to think how do we throw up barricades around the places that we, these places that we want to protect, it makes more sense to think of how do we intelligently organize the places where people are. Uh, and in fact, that's the way you create those places that you, you want to protect by, by putting the people on. The example, I've given, the, the example I'd like to give regarding Vermont, uh, which is that if you spread New York City, res the 8.2, 8.3 million residents of New York City out into population density of Vermont, you would need a land area equal to that of Vermont, Maine, New Hampshire, Connecticut, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Delaware, New Jersey, Maryland, and Virginia. And then of course you'd have to find places to put all of those people. So when people talk about and when people talk about urban sprawl, they're doing a disservice to urban. It's not an urban phenomenon. It's a, it's a, a suburban phenomenon. It's, a, it's an outer urban phenomenon. And I think it's driven by this idea, by the, I'll just pick the Sierra Club to blame it on, by the Sierra Club notion, by that this form of environmental notion that in order to be, in order to be alive, I need to be in direct contact with what I, considered to be nature, what I call nature, which is what drove, drove my life and me before we lived. But if you do that, it's, you know, you're, in order to replicate that experience, the next person has to move a little bit beyond you. And someone said to me, sprawl is driven by people escaping sprawl. And it, it's not a, it's not a, uh, it's not a strategy that has a, has an endpoint. It, uh, it, it, it's self-replicating. Uh, are there, uh, yes, yes. Um, yeah, do you, do you think there is a critical density where these environmental benefits begin to accrue? For instance, Los Angeles is a large city. I think you mentioned the population density is about 130th of Manhattan. Does Los Angeles begin to see any environmental benefits from being a city that's denser than the rest of the country, or are they basically like everybody else? No, they're, they're, they, they're, they're definitely have, and I, I can't remember the exact numbers, but if you they're much denser than most places in the United States, and they have the same, they have, uh, proportionately, they have, uh, uh, their, uh, and Angelino's carbon footprint is smaller than other people's. Uh, there's lots to dislike about Los Angeles, uh, but the, in, in, it's more efficient than, for example, well, than Kansas City. It's more yeah. in, denser. So it's sort of like a little bit of density is better than no density, and more density is better than a little bit of you know, there's, it's sort of sliding continuous scale where there's always some benefits that accrue by having a greater density, regardless of where you start. I don't think it's continuous. I think there's, because the way I, I kind of think of it, I don't think there would be any gain to the globe of, of, of increasing the density of this 4,000 person town where I live. I think that ideally from the, a global perspective would be to, to freeze it and let, because by definition almost anybody who's moving there is moving from someplace more dense, and although you're increasing local density, you're, you're just sort of, it's as though you're, you have an inefficient machine and you're running it, running it longer. And I think you would sort of draw a line of median density and try to increase the density of the denser places and just and, and let the rest stop. I think there's also a sort of a, uh, there's a, a discontinuity at the other end too, where people sometimes say that, that as you increase density, transit use will rise to a certain point and then it plateaus and, and, and that's in, in there so there is no point in increasing density beyond that point say by having buildings taller than four stories sometimes four stories is the limit that people will talk about we shouldn't go any taller than that but actually what happens is that in, you see in new york is that if you uh, increase density to a certain point even transit becomes inefficient is perceived as inefficient by by residents and they and they start to walk so I think that the, the benefits of density uh, continue and extend and, and grow beyond, often beyond points where people think, well, we've, this is enough. We don't need to get any, we don't need to get any density in this. The thing that amazes me when, when I think about it is that the, the nearest walking destination from my house now 
uh, from my back door is my mailbox, which is 150, 150 yards from my back door. Within 150 yards of the uh, door of our apartment building on 2nd Avenue, I had two grocery stores, a Gristidi's and a Food Emporium, and then all, all these other places, plus the residences of, of, uh, of thousands of people who were almost entirely strangers, but, but potentially of pe all these people that, that you could have seen. So it's, there is, uh, it's a great engine uh, if, you can, if you can arrange it right. Unfortunately, well, I think most of the time, times when we try, to, we try to do it on purpose, uh, we end up with something, uh, something that's wrong. Dubai is a good example in the news lately of a, of a, a good example of something I've heard referred to as density sprawl. It's just, a, it's a completely irrational kind of density. It's, it's it, a, a, an almost a phenomenally automobile dependent city. It looks like, from Google Earth, it looks like Manhattan in many ways, but you, there's no, you can't get around it without a car. Uh, I, I've stayed in three different hotels in, in, in Dubai and there's literally no place that I could go to any of the three on foot. There was no walkable destination. You, you go out into this phlegm colored air and get into the most astonishing traffic jam, which is made worse by the fact that they're constantly, uh, maybe not now that they're the, the sort of Ponzi scheme that financed the whole thing has fallen apart, but the, 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 the nightmare traffic was made even more nightmarish by the fact that they were constantly tearing apart and trying to extend, expand existing roadways to make them bigger and build more overpasses and things like that. So I think it's, it's better, to, it would be better to freeze the, the less dense places and densify the, and intelligently densify not only in people but also in destinations. It's not only density of, of citizens but density of places, places to go. Yeah, oh, let's do that, yes. So if, um, let's say, Frustrated President Obama is coming back from Copenhagen on his plane to read your book and calls you to Washington now to be advising him. Are you going to be, would, would you be telling him, okay, take your education budget and give half of this to New York and take all this federal highway money and invest it in public transit in New York and change some of the other tax incentives that allow people to be built doing the risk for all? I do think, I think it's too bad, to, I think that the stimulus funds, if we're going to invest in infrastructure, we should be investing it in where we want to get to, which would be in, in helping to, uh, investing it in urban cores, in the, sort of the places with the greatest possible, greatest potential to achieve walkable transit, transit uh, uh, dependent Areas, which would be would be in cities. Instead, we we we've, we've kind of done the opposite. It tends to be things like building roads and encouraging people to buy cars and, and build build ever more houses. So, uh, it, I guess I would say I would say that, and I would also say that I, I think that the, the simple tool we learned we saw what it was in 2008, which is that if you is has to do with how you price energy, uh, and if you price energy correctly, then people make good decisions. You know, I love the things that happened in 2008, uh, automobile transit miles went down, uh, public transit use went up, uh, carbon footprint went down, um, the, we killed the Hummer, at least temporarily, the, the automobile companies were, went into bankruptcy. Uh, all of this very, with a very, our, the price of, uh, of gasoline in this country didn't even get to half of what it was in Europe, and all these uh, effects reverberated through our country, all these good environmental effects. And yet the, the response, the political response was basically that we must make this stop immediately. There were cries that we have to stop taxing the, uh, fuel at the state level to drive the price back down. We should release oil from the National Strategic Reserve. We have to put pressure on OPEC to drive the price of oil back down. So politically, I don't know that there's a possibility of anything happening. But I would, my preference would be to, I think, Cap and trade is too susceptible to this hocus pocus and self delusion, and would be more in favor of uh, a carbon adjusted energy tax. And there are ways to do it to make it revenue neutral. I like this idea that, uh, about uh, there was just a uh, there were a couple of people at EPA, and then there was somebody in the op ed page for James Henson. James Henson. James Henson. Tax and dividends, or whatever you call it, where you tax energy and then you return the money to people. Basically, at the, at the median level, so that if you 
if you're <coughs> using less than the median, you come out ahead. If you're using more than the median, you have an incentive to, to cut back. It's on the same principle as a uh, babysitter payment method devised by some people that I know. Uh, the, there was a couple that were entertaining people in their house. Uh, their babysitter uh, wasn't available at the last minute. She had two young sons. She was worried that they were just going to be a problem at the party. So she gave them each five $1 bills uh, and told them that they could come downstairs in an emergency, of course, but that for any other reason, every time they came downstairs, they had to pay her a dollar. <laughs> and uh, they played nicely by themselves all the time. They had, them, they had the money in their hand and they were actually making I think people, I think people tend to, to solutions of all kinds, so all kinds of problems tend to work better when you are harnessing human nature rather than trying to change it. So my, my advice would be to think of ways to, uh, to do that. That's completely impossible, I'm sure. I pretty much speculate that the whole speculative bubble and oil collapsed, you know, at the end of 2008 because for the first time in decades, Americans actually cut the number of miles they drive, and that scared the Jesus out of powers that be. Maybe. We didn't cut them by that much. But we did cut them by some, by some, it was by some amount. They did, they did it was actually down. cut instead yeah. of going up no matter what the price. Yeah. It was a, if that was, a, well, we'll see. We'll see. <laughs> the world's oil consumption is still, uh, still climbing. But I do know that when I got my first delivery of home heating oil at $4.83 a gallon, I, I uh, took up the insulation project that I've been putting on for 25 years. <laughs> and then as soon as it went back down below $2, I stopped immediately. <laughs> uh, yes? I just wanted to uh, touch on your premise of density is good for the environment, right? And you have density because individuals are making choices. And you cited Kansas City as a place where people are making a different choice yes. rather than New York. And you talked about some of the maybe dominant factors in that choice, which is crime, education, and public health. So what things, what factors could you change to make more people choose to live in a dense environment? Well, I think you, you, you unbury the costs of, of sprawl, uh, the, for one thing. In addition, we, I mentioned you know, addressing the things, issues, the, the, the urban issues that drive people out of cities. I think you have to also address the economic uh, incentives that we provide to people to, to live in inefficient ways. And there, there are lots of them, and they're mostly hidden. Uh, many of them have to do with the automobile. The, the, um, uh, one the thing I argue in the book is that if the critical energy drain in the suburb is not the Hummer in the driveway, it's the driveway. It's everything that the, the, the Hummer makes possible and, and necessary. It's this huge uh, infrastructure network of roads and sewage treatment and power generation and schools and malls and all this duplicated, redundant, inefficient infrastructure that we require as we, we spread out. If, we, if things we did made were economically rational, we wouldn't spread out like that because it's extraordinarily costly and inefficient. But the reason we do it is that we, we actually create incentives to people to do that. The, the cheap land is, at the, is always at the margin. We provide, we bring the roads out to meet it. We bring the utilities out to meet it. Uh, we, instead of, uh, instead of concentrating the cost on the people who, who create these expenses, we tend to encourage them. We often give them tax breaks in order to do this because we view that kind of growth as, uh, as, a, as, a, great, uh, as a great boom. Kansas City certainly is the Example I give in the book is a Sprint corporate campus in Kansas City, which is way out beyond where we used to go to get high when I was a kid. And it's this huge uh, lead certified uh, sprawl bomb. Uh, it's, I can't remember how many buildings. I think there are uh, 19, 19 buildings and 20 parking garages. And on a 200 acre campus, and, and they, you know, they preserve open space. Uh, but it required this massive, uh, it, dra it dragged with it as it went, this huge sort of mantle of infrastructure, including uh, suburban subdivisions. The counterexample uh, is a building that I, use, that I use in the book. It's a building right here in New York. It's the, it's the four times square, which is always called the first green skyscraper in New York. Well, actually, I think every, any building in New York is greener than the lead platinum building almost anywhere else, because if you consider the full life cycle analysis and you, and you consider the context in which it's placed. Uh, four times square is a one and a half million square foot 
building, office building that doesn't have a parking lot. Uh, and the reason it doesn't have one is that the 6,000 people who work there, 95% of them walk to work or take public transit. If you broke that building up into standard uh, uh, Kansas City style industrial park little office plazas, each one would have a huge parking lot and each one, and they would be spread far apart and would draw all this, this infrastructure along with it. Uh, whereas uh, we, in New York City, you do the thing that, you know, we're, we build up and we and all these benefits accrue. I gave a talk once where I said that, the, I suggested that the Nature Conservancy, instead of buying um, pieces of unspoiled land and preserving them forever should buy parking lots in, in dense urban areas and put apartment buildings on them because they, in doing that they would both beneficially increase the local population density and then also increase the aggravation of drivers making uh, more people likely to give up their cars. Uh, but usually we, we, we do the opposite. So I think we need to do both of those things too. If, we, if suburban dwellers had, if we, if we, it's, it's, I think economics works pretty well if you use it right. If you put the costs in the right places where people feel them and see them, they tend to, to act in their own self-interest. Yes? I, I just have a comment on education. Having grown up in one of those awful areas, I, I call where I grew up, Levittown, the ground zero for the <laughs> decline of American civilization. A lot of, this, this sprawling culture has, has such a lock on the American imagination that a lot of people growing up in these environments as kids don't know that there's any real difference, you know, there's any alternative. Yeah. I grew up, when I was a kid, I thought I was going to be a house owner and a car owner just like everybody else. And as soon as I was exposed to an alternative, I like took to it like a duck to water. But you got to know there is an alternative to, you, know, you see all the hassles that your parents are going through growing up. You, 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 you see all the aggravation, the dependence, the, 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 the uh, slavery that masquerades convenience. You know, it, it's like you don't know that there is an alternative. You think you're going to fall into the same old world like anyone else, and that's part of the part of the thing. It's firing up the imagination and the culture and to show these children that there is an alternative and that there is a, a lot of advantages to it. It's interesting too. I think uh, even when I was was pretty young, it, 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 kids playing outside had become a, a relative rarity, and now it's almost unheard of in the suburbs. You can, you can uh, go for miles to suburbs and not see anybody walking, for example. I've done it for less, five hours on the island. Not seeing another, not seeing another uh, Much less see, you, you not only don't see kids outside walk. playing, you, the only people, you don't see anybody walking to a destination. You'll sometimes see people moving between a building and a car, or you'll see them trying to lose weight. <laughs> <laughs> Alice, my son now goes to school in Boston, and he tells me how cold it is. Uh -huh. And he grew up in Westchester, and he always walked. Uh, he was always driven everywhere. Right. Yeah. So I don't think he ever walked anywhere. And now in, in the campus, you know, there are these big stretches of walking. But they have to go, actually so go outside. He said, it's, it's so cold here. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it just hit me. That's why, because. Well, it's, it's true. It's very true. It's very true. It's very true. And, uh, it's scary. In, you know, I will often read in, in uh, environmental, in, 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 in well-meaning books about cities and the environment. They'll say that we have to create green spaces in cities so that people will go outside because people will not go outside in a, you know, in a concrete urban environment. In fact, the opposite is true. Uh, if you want to see people outside, don't go to a suburb. Uh, you know, go to New York City where you can sometimes have trouble advancing because there's so many people surrounding you. And you see, not only see crowded streets crowded with pedestrians, but you see them at all hours of the day. And that is beyond unheard of anywhere else in the country except in the cities. The other place is uh, uh, campuses. And the, I think that for people who resist the idea of Manhattan as, a, as an environmental model, should think back on their college years. And uh, a typical American residential college is a total green uh, uh, role model it, people live in very small spaces, very efficiently in small spaces. They walk to almost everywhere they go to their work, if they're working, uh, and to entertainment. They, uh, yeah, they even eat very efficiently uh, in, in large groups fed from central kitchens. So, you know, you'll see lots of talk on college campuses uh, where, you know, we, we put solar panels on the roofs. We have to, you know, we need, um, 
we need to do all these things to make our campus green. That campus is, this is probably the greatest moment in that student's life. And if they want to do something really green, you know, like cut out the spring vacation in Mexico yeah. and stay on campus and just continue walking. <laughs> somebody, when I was, in, uh, I was in Las Vegas, and somebody uh, there described the automobile to me as a uh, device for conveying air conditioning between buildings. <laughs> um, it's also, and yet, it would be, it would be foolish to deny the incredible power of the automobile. It's an extraordinarily powerful, attractive thing, and it's not for no reason that we have built this. Uh, automobile, automobile dependence is the cigarette smoking of the 21st century. Well, that's there, there's, there's, that's good, and I think it's, it probably has a similar attraction. Uh, a friend of mine was. Uh, uh, came in the kitchen and saw her 10-year-old son looking gloomy and angry in the kitchen. He was 10, and she said, what's the matter? And he said, I wish I had a car. <laughs> and, uh, I, think that's, uh, I think getting your driver's license is one of the few milestones in life that really never disappoints, so, although many New Yorkers don't uh, never even reach it. They call it the car mitzvah. The car mitzvah. It's actually a, it's a problem in, in New York when ta talking about voter registration. And, uh, and uh, voter rights and the, the requirement that you have a uh, show a driver's license in order to vote. And uh, many New York City residents of uh, voting age do not have driver's license. It's not a problem in other parts of the country. Uh, yes? Ms. David, I thought one of the best parts of the book was your critique of lead. And we oh, <laughs> we have some lead. museum. And I was just wondering whether you've gotten much feedback yet on I'm very supportive from people who, I think that the, the uh, I've heard from, I say, I say nothing but mean things about Lee in the book. Um, Why? Uh, I think it, I think it uh, is a, uh, I'll give an example from, since I'm a purely an anecdotalist, I'll give an example from there, that just a, a, a friend of mine uh, built just what is the first Lee Platinum house in Connecticut. It costs about $500 a square foot. It, it, it has every conceivable, really, every conceivable bell and whistle, uh, every green gadget that there is. It's on a 13-acre piece of former farmland. It's six miles to the nearest grocery store. It has a, uh, it's, uh, it is a, it's a house. <laughs> it's a, it's the, the context that it's in, there's no such thing as a, uh, uh, as a green building, I mean, as a, as a sustainable building, uh, as a sustainable person, as a sustainable office, as a sustainable car. Sustainability is a network, and it's a, it's a, it's a macro concept. And I think that LEAD encourages a, uh, a, a tendency, an understandable tendency, to stop thinking at the building skin. Even with uh, the new LEAD, uh, uh, the neighborhood uh, development LEAD, it's still, uh, it, 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 Treats green as a, uh, I think, a, a menu of luxury upgrades, basically, mm -hmm. rather than as a, a a true strategy for doing for doing something. And it's a, it's understandable because <coughs> lead really is it's a tool for developers for, for architects. It's a it, it, and the, the kind of the the green uh, lead uh, gadgets have taken the place really, or they filled the same place that uh, marble kitchen counters and super uh, bathroom and kitchen upgrades did uh, in an earlier uh, period of real estate development. It's what the, the equivalent in the funeral industry is called, it's called loading the casket. It's the, the, those are the easiest parts of a, of, of a house to make more expensive, and there's the, they have the highest margin. And I think, I think it's completely well-intentioned, but I think that the, some of the, I think that the, um, some of the, the consequences are, are the wrong ones. The way, it, 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 and I think it's also a, 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 a manifestation of, of our tendency to think that solutions are, are high te are tech. Uh, we have an environmental problem, we need to invent things to, to do it. And the, an example I talk about in the book is, uh, is Natural Bridges National Monument in southeastern Utah. It's a, it's a part of the park, National Park Network. It's entirely isolated from any power grid, so they had to generate their, they generated all their electricity with diesel, they had diesel generators. In the 1970s, the federal government turned it into a demonstrator project. They created a, uh, they made it solar power, and so it has a little solar field, uh, and it now runs on solar. But in order to do that, they have a 
there's a large room, I think it's 90, or I can't remember how many, 190,000 uh, 90, pound lead acid battery, I can't remember, in a climate controlled room. They have two backup diesel generators. They can run for, for two days off the solar power, but they can't, to, to, they can't handle the cooking or the heating with it. Those are both done with propane. The vehicles run on diesel, and in order to run even what they have left on, on the solar, they had to reduce their energy consumption from the diesel days by two thirds. The reduction by two thirds is a zero co cost uh, energy cut. We, can, we understand the technology for it right now. It doesn't require any investment. You can make that cut to two thirds. And so to focus on the, on the, the gadgetry, on the technology, when it has to be, in order to mean anything, it has to be accompanied by the, this, this other part, which we already understand, we know how to do, and we can do right now. I think that's where the problem is. And of course we'd rather think, oh, you know, uh, fusion is, nuclear fusion is gonna handle it all, or uh, there's this great new thing where uh, we can grow algae with, we feed this to algae, then we feed the algae to the fish, then we catch the fish and we turn them into fuel, we turn the fish into fuel, which is one that I, I just saw. It would be, it's much simpler, it requires much less investment to, to eliminate the, the need, that need uh, just right off the top. Then you don't have to build anything more you go. Yes? I wonder if you have any comments about organized ways of um, encouraging density, such as the smart growth and new urbanism movements and transit-oriented development and urban growth boundary out in Portland. Um, your critiques of LEED are, are interesting and compelling, but I wonder if that extends also to the LEED and the LEED for neighborhoods, where they do try to take on that Yeah, they do try to think. It's, it's, hard to see how, it's hard to see how it plays out. I, I, I'm, I'm sort of skeptical about the, uh, about almost everything we try to do on purpose in terms of urban planning. And the brilliant, the, all the brilliant things about Manhattan are entirely unintentional. And almost everything that New Yorkers have done, many things that are Carol seeing your head, many things that New Yorkers have done it, 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 have, have, have worked in the opposite direction. The, the idea of creating plazas around buildings, for example, to create open space within the city, they often, have, they often undermine the very effects that, that, that make it green. I think one of the greenest things about New York, and one of the least appreciated uh, 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 features of New York City is this entirely <coughs> accidental, uh, naive, self-invented version of this uh, Dutch traffic control feature that people are in love with that, that involves uh, blurring this, the, the Wunerk, I'm not even sure how to pronounce it. Wunerk. If you blur the distance between car and pedestrian areas, and it's, this, it's this, this sort of counterintuitive idea that you slow down traffic by, not by making it more clearly defined where cars are supposed to go, but by eliminating the boundaries and making it more confusing where the cars are supposed to go. <laughs> you basically make it ambiguous, or you put things in the way of drivers and they slow down. New York City has always done this completely accidentally. If you go on a side street, it's, it's riddled with potholes. You can't drive. You can't drive at speed. There's you know, two kind guys smoking a cigarette next to a manhole. Car. There's a FedEx truck double parked. There are two kids throwing a football in the street. Uh, there are uh, the cars moving at one mile an hour, so you can safely jaywalk. These are all these these features all have uh, environmental benefit, and they they arose entirely. It's like a it's like natural selection, they, they arose all by themselves. They think, oh, it must be, it's not intelligent design, it just happened all by itself. I think, we, I think the, the, the human record of doing things on purpose has been less good. There are many exceptions, and Carol, Carol knows them. But I think we often, I was just recently in, in Boston, we gave a talk at the uh, Boston Public Library, and there was a, these beautiful apartment towers right next to it, which they had just come to believe, and they'd clearly been thought out, they had these beautiful big raised plazas uh, around them. And it was just like a total, absolute uh, dead zone and, and blockade. You could not get from here to the library, as I discovered when I went up onto this plaza, because it ended in a, in a fence on this side. There were no stores or any place. There were no people. There was like one, one person having an illicit conversation on a, on a cell phone. And down the street, where the, the stores were and the hubbub was, and it was thronged throng with people, but here was this place that had been designed to be an attractive urban space. It was actually a, just a, like a, a desert drop down into the middle of the city. Um, the, so uh, there are definitely things that, and, and there are thoughtful people. I don't think smart growth has always worked out the way it was meant to, same with new urbanism, but it's, it's definitely the right, it's trending in the right direction. 
Um, yes. Oh, sorry. Oh, yes. Oh, well, I was going to say I was going to take the prerogative of asking the last question before we have the wine reception. You can individually um, okay. ask some questions, and especially because we're relying on the heat above and the heat below <laughs> in okay. order to um, well, keep, the us, keep us uh, of yeah, keep buildings. us. Uh, I had an editor at Esquire who said that uh, he, he grew up in a row house in Philadelphia and he said his, uh, his, his parents always knew when the uh, neighbor on either side got evicted because their heating bill was spiked. Uh, <laughs> but, but, oh, but, but I, I, oh. My, my comment um, is apropos of the exhibition on Shanghai, which I hope you all look at, and, uh, and the previous one in Hong Kong, I, I think it's sort of at our peril that we don't that we just look at the US and don't look at the world because when you look around the world the world is urbanizing oh yes you can't keep people from moving into cities that um, whether it's by uh, rural poverty and the opportunity the opportunity that's represented by the metropolis or whether uh, it's a program in China of moving the largest mass migration in human history, where they're going to move 400 million people off of uh, farms and into the cities. The direction of the 21st century is urbanization. And it's good. It's a good thing. It's, it's a good thing to densify people. We just need to do it the, the right way. And now, unfortunately, we're not solving the environmental problems with, you know, China is, is not pointing the way through density in order to solve those problems. There, there's good density India. and there's bad density. And there's uh, China and India, both, uh, India is an example. India is now building the, uh, com completing the, this tremendous uh, equivalent of the American interstate highway system. Uh, and the introducing a, a car that will be within re reach of, of uh, many, many people. The, it's not a, a good thing for uh, the future of India, much less the future of uh, resource hungry the United States, that uh, to be, for the world to be following this our worst example. Uh, it's it this apparently irresistible example, but it's a, uh, it's like, a, and I think that it, the, the discussion of the rest of the world is often framed in this, uh, you know, what right do we as Americans have to tell other people how to live? I think we can say that, you know, we built out our continent, or we're in the process of building it out, according to this, uh, this model that, has, that does not go all the way to the end. Uh, it's if you build a, uh, a continent that's based on the automobile, you, you get in, you reach a serious crisis point when the automobile becomes economically untenable. And, and I think it's easier to uh, prevent people from jumping off a cliff than it is to try to stop them once they've begun to fall. <laughs> and it's a shame, I think, you know, for not not out of selfish reasons, but out of the, this, you know, we. If I, it's like what my father said about his drinking was, well, so maybe I set a good example, negative example for you. I mean, at least we can think that as as the world's energy gluttons, we set a negative example for the rest of the world. But it seems instead that we that we exert this extraordinary. Uh, car. When I was in China a few years ago, uh, I was in a car with a driver. He was driving a Buick. Uh, he was driving a Buick, which we even try to find a Buick in the United States. Uh, it's an extraordinarily popular car in China. He was driving a Buick Park Avenue, and down the, the this alley, this centuries-old alley that uh, was so narrow because it was designed for pedestrians hundreds of years ago, that he had to fold back the mirrors on the side of the car to keep them from snapping off, and he, I said, I'll just run up and, you know, the, the door of the place we were going was just a, a hundred feet up. And he laughed and like, oh, oh, like we, we have a car, we will drive. And even though he had to go this around, this way, it, it would have taken two seconds for me to run up. But we had to drive through honking with people out of the way and people were passing in the doorways. But there was this, not only was he extraordinarily fulfilled and proud to be driving this automobile, but the people who were getting out of the way seem to accept it. Like, yes, if you have a car, you will drive. Mm -hmm. And that's the that's what we uh, that's I think that's the the problem that the world faces. And there are all these things that we can say, but there is this extraordinary power of the of the car, and uh, it's I, I I I don't know what force other than economics can turn it in the other direction. Oh, and you you. Uh, Want to answer the last question? Yeah, quick question. I, I feel a little bit like you're positing the environmental movement as a kind of straw man. Oh, and definitely. To, to me, it doesn't really <laughs> work that much. First of all, I think you're exaggerating a bit. Manhattan without Central Park would be unlivable. You know, that's that's one thing. So there has to be some open space where people can't breathe. You know, we have evolved over millions yes. of years with trees in the savannah. So that's one thing I would say. The other thing is that.
that the cause of sprawl is not the Sierra Club or John Rear, it's all the tax breaks that you mentioned, the externalities, and the fleeing of the middle class from the centers and the refusal to pay taxes and to flee the communes. That's really been the cause of the sprawl, you know, much more than some environmental ethos. So I don't know, that just seems yeah, like No, I'm sure. Yeah, I definitely treat it as a straw man. And uh, it's even worse than that. Um, <laughs> but the, uh, will be just blind to <laughs> scroll. Well, I think, I do think, I, I sometimes I try to modify, I say mainstream American or hippie era, uh, but there is a sort of, the, I think that, that we're not helped by the, the idea that the, the, that the way you, uh, that the way to be good for the environment is to move toward the land, which I think is very powerful in a certain, uh, I know in Seattle, I talked to a group called Great City, which is working to, uh, trying to, uh, uh, Build, densify, and, and make more pedestrian friendly parts of downtown Seattle, which are definitely not, and more, more transit friendly. And uh, these were young young kids, looks like young kids to me, they're probably in their 30s, and they said that the, the, the harshest resistance they were getting was from, uh, from sort of hippie era uh, environmentalists who, uh, uh, guys in their 60s, who uh, back to the land. The sort of the back to the land idea, who viewed any form of development in the city as a as a crime, and so I think that there are. I think that there there's not the this is not the only sort of conflict and co contradiction that we have to deal with. I was, I was saying to somebody, I said that for eight years it was possible to it was easy to be an environmentalist in, in, in the United States. Uh, during the Bush years, you could you could be a purist because the chance that anything would actually happen or anyone would pay attention to what you were talking about was close to zero. By contrast, there's a, there's a somewhat different uh, political atmosphere now, and there's also, I think, in the world, there's more of a of a sense that you know, we face these great challenges and we have to do something. And now we it, it's no longer easy because now we encounter all the, the political uh, difficult the, the political realities, and also the the environmentalist versus environmentalist conflicts. There was one in the, the Mojave Desert where the, there was a, a proposal to build a very large, uh, a large-scale solar uh, uh, array. array, and it was killed by environmentalists. And both were right. You know, there was there was two groups of environmentalists. You see the same thing in Nantucket Sound with the wind, wind, the wind turbines uh, versus the wind, the pro wind turbine environmentalists versus the anti wind turbine environmentalists. You see it with hydroelectric where. Uh, we had this, the, the single most successful source of green power in the history of the United States. Uh, the, the Hoover Dam alone uh, produces more than twice as much electricity as all the photovoltaic panels in the United States through, I think, 2007. I don't know what the numbers are since then. Uh, and yet there's, a, there's an equally powerful, equally rational, equally correct movement that is argues for the, the taking down of, of dams, and successfully in many places. So once we, we start to to deal with these things, we once they cease to be purely uh, hypothetical, uh, we run into these conflicts. And nuclear is another one where I was talking to talking to someone uh, who's a profound, who, who is so much more profoundly uh, into all of these issues than anybody else I know, and who is a calls himself a, re a reluctant nuclear advocate. And so, but you know, so they're. Once you actually start to get in the position of trying to do things, then, then everything becomes extraordinarily complicated. Yeah. So, yeah. so, so I think our, our, our red wine is green. <laughs>